Welcome back to part three of this tutorial on the cerebellum. I'd like to say a little bit more about the functions of the cerebellum and then talk to you some about dysfunctions of cerebellar circuits. So my learning objectives are that you would discuss the means by which circuitry in the cerebellum aids to increase the success of volitional motor performance. And I want you to be able to describe the clinical signs and symptoms associated with cerebellar damage. Well, let me first summarize uh, both the anatomy and also now the function of these cerebellar circuits. And I'll um, reinforce for you our functional division of the cerebellum into a medial spinal cerebellum, a lateral cerebrocerebellum, and an inferior lobe that we call the vestibulocerebellum. So beginning with the largest of these divisions, the cerebrocerebellum. The cerebrocerebellum includes much of the hemispheres of the cerebellar cortex that we can appreciate when we see the cerebellum in the human brain. And these hemispheres send connections into the dentate nucleus down um, in the deep white matter of the cerebellum. The dentate nucleus sends its output through that superior cerebellar peduncle up to the circuitry of the motor thalamus that engages our premotor and motor cortex. And we think this part of the cerebellum is especially concerned with coordinating, organizing, and perhaps even planning the skilled execution of behavior that we do with our hands and our feet. So the connections suggest that this may be the case because the output of the dentate nucleus is largely engaging circuits that will impact the functions of the premotor cortex. The spinal cerebellum sends its inputs down to the more medial parts of the deep cerebellar nuclei, engaging the interpose and the vestigial nuclei. The interpose nuclei are growing connections that impact the motor thalamus and can, um, in turn, directly affect the output of the motor cortex. Uh, but the interpose nuclei together with the vestigial nuclei are also growing axons into the brainstem reticular formation. So we think that together these inputs are governing uh, the execution of behavior more so than the uh, planning for the skilled performance of what we do with the distal extremities. So it's a fine distinction there, perhaps one not worth making, but at least anatomically speaking, we associate the spinal cerebellum more with the control of let's say the more proximal parts of our limbs together with our postural muscles and our muscles that we use for locomotion. Whereas the cerebrocerebellum we associate with the activities that are guided by the premotor cortex that are especially involved with the skilled behaviors that we do with our hands and our feet. And that leaves us with the vestibulocerebellum, that flocular nodular lobe that is directly connected with the vestibular nuclear complex of the brainstem. This nuclear complex, as you know, is mainly concerned with the feedback adjustment of posture given signals that are associated with the accelerations of the head. And these adjustments typically help to stabilize our posture against some unanticipated disturbance. So this has been a summary of the anatomy that gives you a sense of what aspects of motor control the cerebellum might have an influence over. Uh, let me give you a little bit more of a sense of exactly what that nature of that influence might be. So when you think about the function of the cerebellum, I want you to think of coordination. The coordination of sequenced movement or multi-jointed movement when it comes to our extremities. When it comes to those domains of planning, perhaps even those domains of reason and problem solving, we can think of the influence of the cerebellum as helping to coordinate the sequences of events that are necessary for planning an act or for solving a problem. And the key operative word is coordination. So the cerebellum, as it coordinates these activities, it can help to improve the stability of our actions as well as their fluidity. Uh, the cerebellum has a role to play in dampening down the oscillations that might have as flexor and extensor muscles are coordinated by lower motor circuits. As the cerebellum is serving to correct errors in motor performance, 
it can also play a role in improving motor performance over time through the accrual of experience. And in this way, the cerebellum can assist motor circuitry in motor learning, because after all, uh, correcting errors is exactly what is necessary for motor learning to occur. The cerebellum may not necessarily be a site where skill is stored, but it seems to be a necessary circuit that is engaged in the process of improving performance and thereby acquiring the skill in the first place. One of the most amazing facts of cerebellar based plasticity that I've learned about is how specific that plasticity can be. Uh, we can do a pretty simple demonstration and in fact I, I hope to show you this demonstration um, to make available for you a video recording of um, one of my experiments in action that involves plasticity and how our visual world is mapped onto our uh, map of motor output or motor intention and this would involve the task of throwing a ball at a target and what we can demonstrate is that the plasticity that takes place, the learning that takes place under experimental conditions can be specific for not only the motor structure that is being used, the arm of the thrower, but also the program itself, that is the way that arm is used. So we can show plasticity of let's say an overhand throw but not an underhand throw. Same muscle, same joints, roughly the same kind of sequence but the details of how that multi-jointed movement is sequenced to perform an overhand versus an underhand throw differ. And it seems to be at that level of the organization of the motor program for movement that the motor learning takes place or the adaptation occurs. So a remarkable degree of specificity in what the cerebellum is actually operating upon to change. Now, it's quite interesting to think that maybe something similar is happening in the domain of cognition. We know that the dentate nucleus sends connections not just to the motor thalamus, but also to more medial parts of the thalamus that send connections to the prefrontal cortex. This suggests that perhaps the coordination, that is the agility that the cerebellum provides for movement of body, might also apply to movement of mind. And one interesting clinical observation has been that patients with cerebellar injuries often fail in problem solving when it requires a sequential procedure. Perhaps you've seen some simple board games or peg games that require um, implementation of a strategy that involves moving in one step, followed by another, followed by another, and another. Well, people with cerebellar injuries, uh, while they are able to execute the motor steps that will be required of the game, what they seem to lack is the capacity to sequence through what one step will lead to and the scenario that the next step will provide. So it's a matter of sequence and coordination of our problem solving faculty that seems to be impaired in patients with lesions in certain parts of the lateral hemispheres of the cerebellum. So I say that just to emphasize that the cerebellum coordinates movements of the body and it also seems to assist in coordinating movements of the mind. So it should not be surprising that clinical populations with cerebellar injuries may have deficits in the cognitive domain as they may in the domain of motor control. So what are those deficits? Well, if the cerebellum is principally concerned with governing the ipsilateral side of the body, then we would expect deficits to be observed in movements of the ipsilateral side of the body. So the important principle for you to appreciate here is that the clinical signs of cerebellar lesions are always ipsilateral to that lesion. Now this stands in contrast to what you have learned about damage to upper motor neurons, where the clinical signs and symptoms are going to be contralateral to the location of the injury. As I've been saying, the cerebellum represents the ipsilateral side of the body, and perhaps this reflects the fact that the spinal cerebellar pathways are set up to provide ipsilateral input. Now, when it comes to cerebellar dysfunction, 
uh, we would expect there to be an incoordination of movement. We call this ataxia. And ataxia can be further characterized by the clinicians. Um, I won't get into that now, but just know that may be coming if you are getting deeper into the neurological sciences. Uh, but there are other aspects of uh, this picture that I do want to talk about. One of them is intention tremor. So patients who have damage to the cerebellum, they tend to have tremulous movement when they are intending to move such as if they were to reach out to grab an object, there is a tremulous movement that reflects an unsteadiness or an incoordination across those joints. There may be an instability of the limb as it approaches a target. It may undershoot a target or it may overshoot that target if one were to reach out to grasp something. So there is a dysmetria which refers to a, a lack of gauging the distance that is required to accurately execute a motor skill. There may be an impairment of alternating movements that is sometimes tested in the clinic. Uh, one should be able to alternately um, rotate around the wrist at a fairly rapid rate and if there is either a breakdown in rhythm or a reduction in speed, then perhaps that suggests that there may be a problem in the governance of that motion via the cerebellum. And then finally, there can be a decomposition of movement. Rather than a smooth coordination across multiple joints in, let's say, a visually guided reach, there may be a breaking down of that motion into component parts. So there can be a decomposition of that smooth coordination or that smooth sequencing of action across these joints. I'd like to leave you with a um, short clip that we recorded in the lab when we encountered a brain that seemed to show evidence of uh, degeneration uh, of the anterior part of the vermis that is fairly characteristic in individuals that have abused alcohol for many years in their life. So one of the most common uh, cerebellar dysfunctions that you may see if you're heading into the healthcare world is alcoholic cerebellar atrophy. And this can result in an impairment of the functions that are performed by the medial parts of the cerebellum uh, involving the vermis and the cortex just lateral to the vermis. This seems to be the region of the cerebellum that degenerates uh, with chronic alcohol abuse uh, for reasons that uh, are not entirely understood. But when one thinks of this part of the cerebellum, I hope you should now recognize this as the spinal cerebellum, which is that portion of the cerebellum that is going to be especially concerned with the um, proximal limb muscles that are important for walking, for posture. And this is likely what explains the staggering gait that is characteristic of individuals that are chronic abusers of alcohol. They may be staggering not because they're inebriated, but because they've suffered this kind of medial and paramedial damage to their cerebellar hemispheres, as you are about to see. Now, I want to show you the cerebellum from what is likely a normal brain in order to compare with this specimen that we have in front of us. So, here we have a cerebellum from an individual who died without neurological complication. And I want you to notice how tight and full are these tiny little branches or folia that form the cortex of the cerebellum. In contrast, this other brain has an unusual amount of space between the folia of the cerebellum. These spaces are indicative of one particular pathology that seems to result in the atrophy of this anterior and medial part of the cerebellum, and that condition is chronic alcohol abuse. So although I do not know these individuals from whom these brains were obtained, nor do I know their medical history, the appearance of the cerebellum in this specimen is highly indicative of chronic alcoholism.
compared to what we see in a healthy looking cerebellum. And this alcohol abuse that I suspect might have afflicted this particular brain is likely to have impaired the coordination of gait and other aspects of locomotion in this individual in life.